We are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 186, Retina Session 38. And today we have with us Dr. Raja Narayanan, sir. And he'll be talking on management of ARMD. I request Dr. Ritesh Narula, sir, to please introduce Dr. Raja Narayanan, sir. A very good evening to all of you. It's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, and welcome Dr. Raja Narayanan, my teacher, to this uh, iFocus session. A person who has been responsible for me learning a lot about AMD and today we are so happy that he is here with us to teach us all about management of AMD. Sir needs no introduction. Uh, he has he's a director at Anand Bajaj Retina Institute, LV Prasad I Institute, Hyderabad, uh, adjunct professor at University of Rochester, New York. He has been an honorary general secretary of VS, VRSI and a principal investigator at I Hope Center. And uh, I won't stand much between you and him. Uh, we have a lot to learn from him. So over to you, Dr. Raja, for this interesting talk, sir. Uh, there is some problem with the network, sir. He'll just talk. Yes. You can speak without the video on there. Right, sir. Yeah, apologies for today and having to uh, switch my video because of the internet issues. Uh, hope I am audible right now. Yes. Uh, once again, I thank CFS and Dr. Honavar uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this prestigious program. I'll be talking about management of age-related macular degeneration. Oh, and, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, sir, but your numerous... screen is not visible. Right, sir, now it's fine, sir. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, and... He's locked back then. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I've no been problem, having sir. issues. So again, I'll share my screen. Hopefully, this time it should work. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I hope my slides are visible. Yes, sir. So again, I would like to thank uh, CFS and Dr. Honavar for giving me this opportunity. I will be talking about management of age-related macular degeneration. And I would uh, request uh, the audience, the students, to actually um, uh, put down the questions on the chat box at any time and or stop me at any time if they wish, or they can take uh, yeah. questions at the end also if they feel. So um, the, the most important thing for uh, uh, fellows and residents at this point of time to understand the retina, especially the macular disease, to know the anatomy of the macula, uh, very well, especially the cross-sectional anatomy, which is shown on the OCT. So without a good understanding of the different layers of retina on OCT, it is uh, almost impossible for a resident uh, or a fellow to actually learn the details about management of various macular diseases. And uh, it's so important that nowadays there are so many biomarkers which are now being talked about uh, without those uh, understanding of the details of the OCT, 
it is very difficult to uh, become a good clinician in medical retina uh, very briefly most of my talk will be on wet macular degeneration but very briefly i will be touching upon the dry armd which is actually much more common than the wet macular degeneration so the dry armd is characterized by drusen as well as uh, geographic atrophy in the older terms in terms of oct classifications new terminology is coming up basically drusen and geographic atrophy are still clinically used terms and uh, even though it is very common in the west uh, in india it is not as common as you would see in the west especially the geographic atrophy is not very commonly seen in our country uh, but uh, if you look at the ocd in these patients you will have uh, both the outer segment as well as the uh, rp atrophy either in patches or in a continuity what we call as incomplete outer retinal atrophy or complete uh, retinal and outer retinal atrophy and fluorescein angiography usually shows a window defect in these cases but most of my presentation will focus on cnvm or choroidal neovascular membrane which actually if you uh, recollect it's actually a sign it's not a disease by itself choroidal neovascular membrane is a sign and it can be caused due to various retinal diseases i'm not going into what is a sign what's a diagnosis and what are symptoms but if you can see in this uh, photograph uh, there are numerous conditions which can be associated with cnvm right on the top left is a choroidal osteoma uh, that can be one of the causes among various causes but age related macular degeneration is the number one cause of a choroidal neovascular membrane and then you have high myopia and then you have various other causes like you have injured streaks here you can also have inflammation uh, you can have idiopathic um, you can have uh, uh, peripapillary cnvm due to various other causes so there are uh, numerous causes which can cause uh, cnvm what are the different types of cnvm types of cnvm include the type 1 cnvm which is sub rp type 2 cnvm is above the rp but sub retinal type 3 is intra retinal then we have the category of aneurysmal cnvm which is more popularly known as polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy or pcv but what is pcv in general pcv is aneurysmal dilation at the edges of the cnvm and these aneurysmal dilations are called polyps but aneurysmal type 1 cnvm so in pcv all the cnvm is under the rp so aneurysmal cnvm or pcv and then we have peripapillary cnvm so while we have these uh, classifications you must be wondering what's uh, classic cnvm and what is occult cnvm we will be coming to that later on slightly which is based on fluorescein angiography classification a type 1 cnvm as i mentioned is under the rp and unless it is large you will not see uh, any significant changes uh, and you may not even see a grayish membrane which typically you may read in books that cnvm is characterized by um, a, a grayish white membrane which is visible in fact in many of these armd cnvms you may just see a pigment epithelial detachment or some subretinal fluid uh, or exudation but it's very difficult to make out a membrane as such so type 1 cnvm are under the rp and they are kind of occult occult meaning uh, something which is hidden so that's why uh, under the rp rp is full of melanin pigment and it is very difficult to detect them both clinically as well as on fluorescein angiography so it's called an occult occult if you look uh, in the dictionary occult means something which is hidden and uh, this is uh, an example of another patient where you see the rp is elevated and under the rp there is a hyper reflective um, membrane with brooks membrane underneath that and there is a subretinal fluid over here and the vision is 20 by 60 and if you do uh, oct angiography you will see that the cnvm in occult cnvm is at the chorio capillaris level if you do a proper segmentation it will be under the rpe and if you do an fa you will see an ill defined uh, membrane 
uh, which won't have uh, very regular borders you will see uh, just uh, hyperfluorescence which is increasing over time but it will not start leaking in the early phases and it will also uh, be ill defined um, and you can have either late leakage of undetermined source or a triple hyperfluorescence in occult cnvm the other next cnvm which i had mentioned is the type 2 cnvm uh, which is uh, as i said above the rpe but beneath the retina so it is subretinal and here you can have patients uh, who will be having obvious subretinal hemorrhage and you may actually see a defined membrane or more obvious membrane in these cases uh, as you can see in this uh, oct corresponding that patient here you can see that there is a hyper reflective material above the rp also and even on the scan apart from the subretinal fluid and some intraretinal fluid so this is a case where you have a type 2 cnvm and in type 2 cnvm you'll see a very nice uh, uh, active uh, membrane in terms of uh, flow uh, signals in the outer retina normally outer retina does not have any blood flow uh, but in these patients you will have a uh, very nice flow signal coming from the outer retina and also in the cori capillaries because obviously these patients have uh, cnvm which arises from the choroid as the word itself implies uh, type 3 cnvm is something uh, in the sense when you say cnvm is a choroidal neovascular membrane but type 3 actually originates within the retina it's also called retinal angiomatous proliferation or rap um, and in this cases you will see as you see in the oct here there will be a lot of intra retinal uh, reflectivity with intra retinal edema and sub retinal fluid in the early stages that is in stage 1 and stage 2 you will not see any rp uh, uh, cnvm under the rpe uh, so these are cases which are also called as retinal angiomatous proliferation or rap the other condition which i was talking about was uh, type 1 aneurysmal cnv or pcv which we more commonly know it as in these cases you will see a lot of orangish nodules which clinically if they are visible they correspond to the polyps uh, seen on icg or also on oct nowadays uh, we have criteria for diagnosing pcv uh, these patients also have hemorrhagic pd hemorrhagic pd means there is uh, dense hemorrhage under the retinal pigment epithelium causing a pigment epithelial detachment they may have also a lot of hard x rays but one feature which is slightly different in these cases from a typical armd cnvm is that you will have uh, less drusen in pcv cases uh, and also these orange nodules which are clinically polyps uh, they are not present in a regular or a typical armd cnvm on the oct here uh, as i mentioned these patients of pcv can have dome shaped pd which is a sharp elevation of pd and one of the slopes can be shallow but at least one side of the pd will be very sharply elevated this dome shape is also called thumb like pd uh, this can correspond to a polyp and you can have uh, you know multiple of them in these cases there will be a lot of intra retinal exudates lot of sub retinal fluid typically in pcv these patients have less intra retinal fluid that is fluid within the retina is generally less compared to uh, regular armd cnvm so you'll have a lot of sub retinal fluid and these patients can have a lot of hemorrhage under the pigment epithelial detachment and if you do an icg in such cases you will see a very nice branching vascular network which is the type 1 cnvm so we have been talking about branching vascular network in pcv all along but what is a branching vascular network it just is another cnvm that is under the rp but you will see these aneurysmal dilations at the edges of the cnvm which is the polyp which we see on icg very nicely but this is the on the left hand side is a corresponding fluorescein angiography on the fluorescein angiography you don't see this uh, polyp very well because these polyps are under the rp and icg is a very good diagnostic tool for any lesion under the rp but fa is not a good tool for imaging the choroid so it's like type 1 is behind a curtain of rp so fa is not good for choroid whereas icg is an excellent tool for choroid 
what about uh, the other types of cnvm classification based on the location you can have it subfovial as the name describes it is under the fovea you can have it juxtafovial which is like 1 to 199 microns from the center of the fovea you can have extra fovial where these patients the cnvms are about 200 microns or more from the center of the fovea and there is peripapillary cnvm which is around the optic disc and there are various causes of peripapillary cnvm one uh, common one is angioid streaks you can have inflammatory like multifocal choroiditis you can also have in optic disc drusen idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension or even idiopathic cause of uh, peripapillary cnvm uh, so what are the types of cnvm fa which typically we read in uh, textbooks uh, classic and occult cnvm in occult CNVM, we will uh, generally have, as I had earlier mentioned, that the uh, angiogram is typically doesn't show any hyperfluorescence in the early phases because, as I said, the CNVM is behind that curtain of melanin in the RPE and FA cannot pick up those lesions very nicely. So, in the later phases, you will see some stippling, you can find hyperfluorescence over here, the, but the margins are not well defined. And on the corresponding um, color fundus photograph, you will not see a grayish white membrane, which textbooks very uh, dis nicely describe in many cases of CNVM. In, in a typical occult CNVM, you don't see that. You don't see a grayish white membrane. And the FA is uh, kind of uh, not uh, very well delineated. The other type of occult CNVM, on FA is the late leakage of undetermined source. Again, it is very late, but profuse leakage is visible. Whereas in classic CNVM, uh, as you can see in this color fundus photograph, you can see actually a grayish white membrane surrounded by at the margins of the membrane, you will see this streak of hemorrhage. And in the very early phase itself, as you can see here, just the artery has been filled, you can see this CNVM is getting filled up already. So compared to the top picture, you see the bottom photographs of occult CNVM, you don't see very good uh, hyperfluorescence in the early phase in uh, occult CNVM, but in classic CNVM, they start filling up very early and they are well-defined margins uh, in classic CNVM. So why, did sh why should we know about these things? So far I have defined uh, based on OCT, that is type one or type two CNVM. Uh, and on FA, we have talked about occult and classic CNVM. Um, oh, sorry, this uh, photograph is not showing up, but this uh, corresponding cartoon, which you can see, uh, the, the predominantly classic CNVM in the out of the overall lesion size of the CNVM, uh, the classic component, if it is more than 50% of the area, it is called predominantly classic CNVM. And in a minimally classic CNVM, if the lesion size, if you draw it completely, the entire CNVM, if the classic component is less than 50%, but there is some CNVM classic component, then it is called minimally classic. As you can see here on the corresponding FA, this is the classic component, but this entire lesion is the overall CNVM, but the classic component is less than 50, so it's called minimally classic CNVM. But you can also have a totally occult CNVM where there is no classic component at all. Unfortunately, the FA is not showing up on this here. But uh, if that is the case where you don't have any classic component, then it's called occult CNVM. So just remember that whatever is seen as occult CNVM on FA is usually a type one on the OCT, which means it is under the RP and the classic CNVM on FA corresponds to a lesion above the RP on OCT. And this is the same kind of uh, FA and ICG. I'm just showing that for PCV, if you do uh, uh, imaging with FA, you will see a kind of occult CNVM because it is type 1 aneurysmal CNVM. Just remember this name again, type 1 aneurysmal CNVM is PCV. So the CNVM is still type 1 in I, uh, PCV. So on FA, you will have an occult pattern. You won't see a very well delineated uh, membrane uh, in the FA, but ICG will pick it up very nicely with the branching vascular network and polyps in those lesions. So what is the natural course of these lesions? Um, uh, occult CNVM, classic CNVM, what is the natural cause? Why do we? Why should we even differentiate them? 
So the 71% minimally classic lesions can get converted to predominantly classic over 12 months, that is one year. That means a lot of these eyes which have a small part which is above the RP, that means it has already broken through the RP from below the choroid, now it has entered the subretinal space. Now these patients can have a slightly more rapid progression, can grow more rapidly in this subretinal space. Whereas CNVM, which is under the uh, RP, completely under the RP, that is pure occult lesions, they do not convert into predominantly classic as much uh, because they are still under the RP most of the time. Um, so what are the OCT characteristics of CNVM? Uh, these patients can have interretinal as I had shown earlier, they can have subretinal fluid. It's very important to make decisions for these patients based on uh, the OCT. So if you ask today, which is the single most important investigation to help decide the treatment in patients with ARMD, it is OCT. So if you see intraretinal or subretinal fluid in any patient with CNVM, Typically, we have to treat them because otherwise these patients will lose further vision and it's very important to monitor their progression. So this is another example of a patient with CNVM that this patient has a PED as well as intraretinal fluid as well as subretinal fluid. So these are the typical features of uh, CNVM on OCT. Uh, then you also have uh, many patients who can have intraretinal exudates or even subretinal exudates as you can see on this OCT. Uh, apart from the cystoid uh, spaces, spaces within the retina, you also have a lot of uh, exudates within the retina in these cases. Uh, you can also have sometimes a scar in these patients, which is just densely hyperreflective. And you can have degenerative cystic changes, or uh, in this case over here, you can have what you call as outer retinal tubulation. That is, they will have a hyperreflective lining around the cystic space. So you can have these uh, uh, in the chronic stages or in the very advanced stage, you can have a discoform scar or uh, outer retinal tubulation or a degenerative cyst. So what is the importance of this etiologic classification? This is a very important slide. Occult versus classic CNVM or type one versus type two CNVM. Uh, what is the importance? While you know, I mentioned that uh, patients who have fluid you typically give an injection, but how often should we give the injections? And if you give those injections, what will be the response uh, to the injections? Will they improve? Will they not improve? Uh, how much will be the improvement? So that depends on whether these patients have classic or occult CNVM. ARMD CNVMs mostly are occult CNVM, that is type one under the RPE, and also CSR and PCV. So CSR associated CNVM, are also typically under the RP. What about type two or classic CNVM, which is above the RP? Sometimes they are seen in ARMD as minimally classic, but majority of the ARMD CNVM will be under the RP. But classic component can be seen in ARMD, but purely classic lesions are seen in myopic CNVM, inflammatory enjoyed streaks or choroidal osteoma or paraphobial telangiectasia. So in fact, or anything which is not ARMD or PCV or CSR, most of them will be a uh, classic CNVM. So what about that? Uh, how does it make any difference? Um, apart from the diagnostics, uh, if you look at the progression and treatment response, type one CNVM will progress very slow. In fact, uh, in the earlier days, one of the criteria for uh, treatment with photodynamic therapy for occult CNVM used to be that there has to be a recent progression, that means a recent drop in vision or a recent subretinal hemorrhage. These are PDT times I'm talking about. What it meant was those CNVMs progress very slowly, whereas classic CNVM, there was no uh, condition that there should be recent onset uh, deterioration or new subretinal hemorrhage. Any classic CNVM was typically taken up for PDT immediately because they progress very fast. Uh, but the other thing we should remember is that uh, CNVM, while it progresses slowly, the improvement in vision in uh, occult CNVM is also not very high and they also respond very slowly, which means you have to keep on giving injections for many years. So in ARMD patients, yeah, I will show you some graphs later on about the treatment 
details you have to keep on giving injections in the first year second year third year patients have received 100 120 injections there have been reports of that so in armd patients which are typically occult patients the uh, the response is slow and they keep on getting injections over many years whereas type 2 cnvm they progress ra- very rapidly if you do not treat them immediately like a young patient who has a myopic cnvm uh, if you don't treat them they will deteriorate rapidly vision loss will be rapid and they will scar down rapidly but if you treat them they also resolve very rapidly so you don't have to treat a myopic cnvm patient for many years like 50 injections or 40 injections usually the average number of injections required for a myopic rear cnvm to stabilize and resolve is about 4 to 5 injections so that's the very most important reason why you should know what are the different features of that cnvm whether it's type 1 or type 2 uh, or is it pcv classic or occult cnvm because the response will be different and that's what you need to tell the patient how my, how many injections will this patient require and how much will be the improvement in vision in these patients and how do the clinical features of armd in indian population differ as compared to the western population because most of the uh, research publications which come out are from the west in terms of large trials of armd and we just try to extrapolate them to our indian population but there are some differences particular in dry armd which i had mentioned earlier these are kind of lesions like so many drusens in this uh, photographs which you see are not normally seen uh, in our population you will see a few drusen in quite a few patients one two or three you can count them but in the western population you cannot even count them there will be so many drusen and geographic atrophy you will see if in so many patients in the west uh, but in indian population geographic atrophy large lesions of atrophy are not very common Uh, what about uh, this condition pcv so pcv is so common in the asian population we know definitely from japanese and korean and also singapore and we also have indian publications many many publications from india also uh, about pcv so pcv that is type 1 aneurysmal cnvm is more common in indians compared to the western population in fact Uh, um, about 40 to 50 percent of CNVM, so-called ARMD CNVMs in India, are due to PCV, and that is something we need to remember in these cases. And that those exudates which you see are more common in PCV compared to ARMD CNVM. Um, so the another uh, aspect which I would like to bring about here. is this is an ocd where you see a very very subtle change of the rp you can see this subtle waviness of the rp where the arrow mark is uh, and you must suspect in these are elderly patients uh, they have a few drusen uh, if uh, there is some uh, flat irregular pd this is what we call them as you must suspect an incipient cnvm or a non exudative cnvm meaning there is still no fluid which is exuding from the cnvm but if you see an oct angiography in these cases or even let us say if you do an fa or icg i fa is not a very good tool at this stage because they are very tiny and under the rp may not pick up but icg can definitely pick up these lesions uh, like an oct angiography you can see a very nice flow signal here Uh, which is confirming the cnvm and the icg is also uh, in these cases will confirm the cnvm so this these are called non exudative incipient cnvm so the other next aspect which i would like to cover is the intravitreal anti vegf injections i am uh, confining myself here uh, to the uh, while i am listing out here but the more or uh, more results which i will show or discuss uh, about the uh, efficacy of different agents i will not be including macugen because while macugen or pegaptanib was the first uh, introduced anti vegf which no longer used it was not efficacious but we have ranibizumab more commonly known as lucentis or now it, it's called accentrix in india we also have bevacizumab the famous avastin aflibercept or ilia and we have brolicizumab or pegenax these are the approved treatments but uh, we should also be looking out for another drug called ferisimab which i'll be very briefly mentioning later on uh, that's also a new drug which is much longer lasting it can last even up to 4 weeks uh, sorry 4 months 16 weeks 
uh, that is a very, very long duration of action for an anti-VEGF agent. Because the biggest problem as of today with these anti-VEGF agents is that you have to probably treat many of these patients monthly, at least initially, but even later on, the duration of action of these injections is hardly four to six weeks. Um, and this is a slide showing the different anti vegf agents which are currently being used. But if you see brolicizumab, which is the latest anti vegf is the smallest of them, uh, just about uh, 28 uh, kilo daltons over here. But uh, it has a much longer duration of action, not because of the molecule, but uh, the number of molecules of brolicizumab, which you can give in 0.05 ml, uh, in the injection is much more than what you can give for ILEA or even Avastin in the center. So the number of anti of uh, molecules which are available in a single injection of brolicizumab is much more. Um, and now I'll be showing some of the uh, data from these uh, trials. Brolicizumab, the two pivotal trials were the Hawk and Harrier. If you can just remember the name Hawk and Harrier for brolicizumab, what it showed was that uh, brolicizumab 3 milligram, 6 milligram, and afriberset were equivalent in both the trials. Um, and it's important to know that um, these are non-inferiority trials because as of today, you cannot have an ARMD patient on a sham injection for one or two years because it is unethical uh, or for most diseases actually. Uh, so, in, when you have a standard of care already available, what you do is a non-inferiority trial and show that the new drug is uh, not inferior to the existing drug and you can get approval. So, brolicizumab uh, 6 milligram is what we are using now, but uh, the important thing was uh, Q8 and Q12 weak arms. So, if you give the patient once in two months as well as once in three months, these patients were maintaining good vision, even if you were giving them once in 12 weeks, that is three months. So what are the different treatment regimens? You can give monthly injections, but it's not recommended, at least for brolicizumab, as I had mentioned earlier. But the label for Lucentis is uh, monthly injections because in the original Marina and Anchor trials, uh, they were given in a monthly fashion. You have other regimens like PRN regimen, which means you call the patient and you inject the patient whenever there is fluid. But the point, key point to remember in PRN regimen is that you have to call the patient back for follow-up and OCT every month. Uh, so it's very difficult for a patient to call, come to the clinic every month. And even for doctors, the clinics may get overcrowded to call the patient every month. So what we do is uh, while you may follow a PRN regimen for a patient, which means monthly visit, but there are other regimens which are being observed more commonly, the treat and extend regimen, where if you uh, give injection in these patients for the first three months, and then you can slowly extend the interval for, uh, to six weeks, then eight weeks and 12 weeks. That is, you don't have to call the patient every month after the first three months. So that's the uh, other most commonly uh, use treatment protocol uh, that treat and extend. So what is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is repeated injections, the number of injections. As I said, uh, there are uh, reports of patients who have received more than 100 injections for ARMD. I don't know what's the biggest number in India, uh, but definitely more than 60 to 70 injections patients are there in India. So how many injections? So what's the end point? These are the questions which both patients ask as well as doctors ask. Unfortunately, ARMD can be a chronic lifelong disease. The only thing is that even if they don't uh, have fluid, you still have to give them injection proactively once in three months as a treat and extent. That is the maximum interval between injection is three months, which means once in, in a year, they will need about three to four injections. What about PDT and thermal laser? PDT is not available in most of the most parts of the world. So PDT is generally not being performed. Even otherwise, PDT was uh, specifically being recommended only for PCV. It was not useful for ARMD CNVM. What about thermal laser? We never do thermal laser for CNVM. We do for extra foveal polyps in PCV patients. Sometimes PCV is not associated with a branching vascular network or CNVM. So if, you, if, an, if it's an isolated polyp kind of a case and they are extra foveal, we can definitely do thermal laser to close them. 
another important point to remember is nowadays a lot of people just look at the oct and anything under the retina if they see you just go ahead with an injection but that should not be the case because you must evaluate the patient clinically look at the oct very carefully what exactly are you looking at so this was a patient in the right eye you can see multiple pigmented scars but in the left eye you see a yellowish membrane and this is what The textbooks classically describe yellowish membrane or a grayish white membrane, but not all grayish white membranes are CNVM. This patient had already received two injections. Uh, he is a younger patient actually. He is not even fifty fifty five. He doesn't come under the category of ARMD. Uh, but still, this patient had been injected uh, twice with no improvement, and this was the OCT with which he had come. You see this subretinal material. You see subretinal uh, fluid. and another uh, deposition of fluid but this patient if you see this uh, hyper reflectivity is different and the rp here is over, uh, a straight line over here so if there had, there had to be a cnvm above the rp it has to come from below the rp so if you see this patient fa so fa or and icg you must do in any case of suspicious cnvm to confirm the diagnosis this is a case of a typical csr and you see this point leak in the very early phases and in this patient we did a navelas guided laser um, and did not give any injection to this patient and uh, after the navelas laser you see that the entire so this was actually fibrin this was not cnvm this was just fibrin under the retina because some of the csr patients can have uh, exuberant fibrinous reaction but this went away with laser so you can see that there is no uh, there was no injection which was given in this patient uh, just to know uh, what happens to the patients after all these injections when you keep on giving these injections uh, that there is some expectations which needs to be set right i i wouldn't call it very disappointing uh, because if you have very high expectations that after three injections or four injections all patients will get 6 by 6 vision in armd i think you are totally mistaken and you will disappoint yourself as well as the patient so in armd patients don't expect patient will get 6 by 6 don't even expect that all patients will improve even eyesight some patients are just maintaining eyesight in fact the outcome primary outcome measure was how many patients did not lose vision that was the primary outcome measure for the lucentis trials not how many actually gained vision because if you realize the actual armd uh, the patients keep on losing vision so merina and anker trial showed that if you see this in the merina trial uh, this lower uh, graph is actually the untreated patients they did not get any injections and you can see by 6 months they had lost 10 letters by 1 year they had lost uh more than 10 letters so there is a very very rapid deterioration of eyesight and by 2 years they have lost even 3 lines or 15 letters so that's how difficult armd is to treat now if you treat them every month still the gain in vision on average is only 6.6 letters so 24 months if you give 24 injections no patient is going to get uh, probably 6 by 6 is going to be extremely rare so why do you treat armd if you don't treat patients are going to end up like this and my analogy is like cancer survival so like if you have a patient let's say with a breast cancer or lung cancer uh, if you say that the survival without treatment is 2 uh, years whereas uh, with treatment it is going to be 5 years the 5 uh, year survival rate um, uh, you know you still have that the treatment right because you get that additional years of life so same way in armd uh, we are not getting every patient to 6 by 6 or normal vision we are just prolonging or uh, preventing their further deterioration or blindness and uh, this is irrespective the cat trial which showed whether you can treat monthly injections so that's why we are not giving monthly because prn also had the same results so you don't have to give the patient monthly injections um aflibercept also had the sorry aflibercept also uh showed al almost similar gains in vision except that if you give monthly the gain in vision was slightly more than if you give it uh, once in 2 months but overall if you look at the integrated data uh, overall the patient still had some improvement in vision but this is the slide which is the real world slide now we have i have shown view study for ilia 
Refli Bursad, Marina and Anchor for Lucentis, Hawk and Harrier for Paginax or Brolucizumab. These are uh, FDA trials called pivotal trials where you have you keep on giving injections either monthly or you know the best case scenario. But in real world life, a lot of patients don't come to us on time. There is a lot of loss to follow up. They drop out and the results are not as good as an RCT. So these are the various uh, real life studies in ARMD. And what you see is that by six months to one year, many of these patients, even if they gain in the first three months because of the injections, monthly injections, by one year, a lot of them show that they are back to baseline. So this can be a very, very disappointing result for a lot of us. And we may start questioning, why should we keep injecting in these patients? As long as the patients follow up, you are likely to maintain the initial gain with these patients had. But even if the patients are put on different regimens, let's say treat and extend, what I had shown earlier that if the patients uh, start losing vision, if they are not treated, even by three months and six months, they lose a lot of vision. But if you uh, treat these patients in the real life world, these are mainly treat and extend trials, uh, you are still able to maintain their eyesight and prevent further damage to their eyesight. So this was the main thing which I wanted to uh, highlight so far on different aspects of ARMD. Um, I will probably skip uh, brolicizumab at this point of time, but I will mention about uh, two other uh, things which uh, I would... Uh, just conclude with one is the port delivery system, uh, which is a long acting delivery system for ranibizumab, where you implant this uh, delivery device within the eye um, and uh, just keep on refilling once in six months or beyond, depending on the OCT. Um, the only thing is the patients should have shown an initial response to Lucentis injections, the regular injection. If they have shown a response, then you can implant this device and then just fill it up with uh, ranibizumab or Lucentis. And then most of these patients did not require even at six months any more injections. But this is a surgical implantation. So these patients had to be taken to the operation theater uh, for implanting this device. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we have published recently that dexamethasone implant can improve the anatomic response to anti vagus therapy. Sometimes even after multiple injections of Lucentis or Ilia, uh, these patients uh, still have massive fluid, intraretinal edema and subretinal fluid. But in these cases, because of the anti vagus resistance, we have injected along with the anti vagus uh, we have injected dex implant. And this is one patient uh, where you see a lot of intraretinal fluid, uh, but after, uh, uh, this is after multiple injections. Uh, but after one injection of the DEX implant, uh, what you can see is the fluid has completely resolved. Uh, that is one, and even after six months, this uh, fluid has not come back. But yes, in many of these patients, the fluid does come back, and it's important that we retreat these patients uh, whenever the fluid comes back. So don't become an OCT specialist. That is, whenever you see dark spaces, you will only inject. So this was a patient who was sent to me um, and not sent to me, the patient came for another opinion saying that he was advised injection because there is some swelling in the retina. And when I saw the patient clinically, uh, this patient actually did not uh, have any reason for a macular edema. In the sense, there was no vein occlusion, there were no cells, he didn't have any other recent history. In fact, I couldn't see any significant changes in the macula because it was a very, very subtle change of edema. And I did not see any other um, major change like a macular hole. It was just a dull foveal reflex, which I saw. But when I repeated the OCT, I saw that this patient actually has a macular hole. So if you don't look at all the scans, so because the macular hole has cystic edges, uh, if the scan is going through the edge of the macular hole and not through the center, and this patient shows you just one scan, and you see that scan, and this may look like the middle scan here of macular edema. But if you look carefully at all the scans or clinically evaluate them, then you will find the actual reason. And this is, in fact, actually a surgical case. There's no role of injecting Avastin or Lucentis if the patient has a macular hole. So you must be very careful about that. And uh, I would like to conclude that uh, get trained before you inject. 
because sometimes you can harm the patient like the previous case it was a diagnostic mistake where the macular hole was diagnosed as macular edema and advised injection but sometimes if you don't uh, get trained and you give the injection uh, you may end up uh, giving in a wrong way so this is a patient uh, who had uh, kind of a diabetic macular edema with cataracts and the, uh, this is a cataract surgeon who uh, actually decided that uh, they will handle both the cataract and the intravitreal injection so they gave the intravitreal injection before the cataract surgery and uh, um, sorry this video was stopping in the middle but if you see this intravitreal injection the surgeon is actually um, giving the injection in the pupillary axis and uh, in the pupillary axis the injection went into the lens and when they did the phaco uh, they had to actually remove the ozdex implant along with the phaco i'm sorry that uh, maybe the signal is weak but they had to you know phaco the ozdex implant at the end so do not uh, try to give injections without getting trained so in conclusion uh, you know the uh, control the urge for injection unnecessarily be sure about the diagnosis and why you are treating this patient and the most common mistake is in clinical evaluation and interpretation uh, cnvm is a sign basically always try to find out the cause of the cnvm and uh, get trained before you inject uh, so i would like to acknowledge a, a few of my colleagues and friends um dr avinash patange kirti akash arshad and mike stewart who have uh, you know over the last few years uh, shared lot of their thoughts uh, on the various trials the various clinical signs and have shared their slides also so this presentation of mine i would like to acknowledge them so thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, i am open to questions right now if you have uh, any questions to ask thank you dr raja that was a real comprehensive uh, talk on air and uh, covering some really interesting and important aspects for post graduates uh, and i can see some nice questions also coming up into the chat chat box here okay i'll start first off with the management question since this uh, topic of today was on management of amd so so one of the first questions which uh, i feel uh, is important for the post graduates here is uh, rashnish wants to know what is uh, how do we define prn uh, uh, what do you mean by prn what do you mean by sham injection in studies that's what his question is from sony that's from dr sony so if i can take the second part uh, first that is sham injection sham injection means you are uh, making the patient believe that they are giving the injection but you don't actually give the injection so in sham injection you don't enter the eye nothing is given inside the eye that's a very good question because uh, uh, there is another category of control arm so if you have a new drug like ranibizumab or brolizumab you're doing a randomized trial you need a control arm so in the uh, active arm you give the drug whereas in the control arm you can either give a sham injection that is you just don't poke the eye and not give any injection you know for maybe ethical reasons uh, that's a sham injection where you don't poke inside the eye but there is another category of uh, a control which we call as placebo injection like we have placebo for many other uh, you know systemic treatment oral injectables uh, typically in eye uh, we don't give uh, placebo injections but some cases placebo injections have been given like in ocriplasmin i don't know if you have heard of ocriplasmin or jetria for uh, pvd injection induction and erm uh, or small macular holes in that trial uh, they had given placebo injection that means they had injected intravitreal saline and compared with ocriplasmin but in a sham injection you don't give placebo you don't inject uh, a saline inside the eye you just touch the syringe no needle just touch with the syringe on the sclera the patient will feel that because the patient has to be double masked right double blind trial so the patient should be no different from the actively treated arm so that is about sham injection and the first question was on prn prn means prorenata that is whenever there is fluid you give the injection but the point is 
okay whenever there is fluid you will give the injection but how often do you call these patients becomes the more important factor because if the patient doesn't come for 3 months or 2 months or 4 months and you say i will give you only when there is fluid but by the time the patient comes after 3 or 4 months and then you see the fluid or you uh, you know these patient lose vision so in prn treatment you give the injection whenever there is fluid only you don't give when there is no fluid but you have to call the patients every month unfortunately most retina surgeons and nowadays in many trials that has become blurred and prn people are giving only when there is fluid but they are also calling the patient only after 3 months not every month but that's not a correct approach unless you call the patient every month then uh, these patient lose vision that's why treat and extend is being followed in many cases that means even if the patient is coming only at 3 months but it is dry there is no fluid on oct you still give an injection but once in 3 months at the maximum interval that you give the injection even if there is no fluid that is treat and extend but in prn you don't give an injection if the oct is dry but the patient has to come every month Uh, doctor has a question from my side for on behalf of post graduates they are very often asked during their exam what is the drug of choice for a, a wet amd or a cmvm so now in terms of current trial what should be their answer on it uh, yeah so this is going to keep on happening uh, changing in numerous uh, diseases not just armd it could be diabetic macular edema not just retinal diseases it could be a question in glaucoma also or lung cancer it could be many of them because more and more drugs will become available and one will be non inferior to the other or equivalent so which one will be the drug of choice now drug of choice you can define it based on narrowing down your question if it's a typical armd for the first time visit uh you see that this patient uh, is only uh, having a, what you call as a minimal scar or not a large pd uh, it's a typical armd active patient many countries are uh, now say that you should give only avastin initially and if there is resistance later on then you switch to either ilia or lucentis uh, so does it mean that avastin is a drug of choice i did not say that it is always a drug of choice it depends on the location what is the side effect profile so that becomes very important if the side effect profile is taken into consideration then the next question is cost effectiveness so what was the first one is efficacy second is the side effect profile and third is cost effectiveness now if you consider all of them and you arrive at a particular answer then you say that okay this is the drug of choice so what can be the answer for that so considering the uh, situation in india for armd let us say drug allocating is a challenge for many practitioners so in standard practice yeah, if uh, allocating a drug is not a you know common practice uh, you know single injectable drug is what we are giving uh, then i would say take the most cost effective drug now because i cannot take any names of any brands but if you take a molecule ranibizumab is probably you can consider as a standard of choice among indian conditions given the efficacy and the side effect profile but if i if you ask me uk or some of the reimbursement uh, medicare or even israeli data shows that they are using bevacizumab as first drug of choice so but in indian conditions ranibizumab is a very safe and cost effective drug choice so rajneesh here asks uh, what would be your absolute and relative contraindications for intravitreal injections i think this for cnvm patients let's put it that way so this is specifically anti vegf so uh, anti vegf contraindications absolute contraindication as of now Uh, uh you know is pregnancy is one because there is no while i some people may have given for compelling reasons one eyed patient losing eyesight in the only eye in a cnvm young patient uh, pregnant lady people have given anecdotal you know reports but absolute contraindication let's say would be pregnancy 
a known uh, side effect to that antivirus. Let's say if you had given one antivirus injection and the patient developed severe reaction to that, that is another absolute contraindication. Now, if you're looking at the other side effect profiles, uh, the most common one which comes into mind is cardiovascular events, which may have happened in a particular patient, let's say stroke or myocardial infarction, I would put it as a strong relative contraindication that too at a duration. It's, it's not like a permanent contraindication. There is a time limit or a duration up to which most people do not inject uh, these anti vegf agents. Typically three months, that is a recent myocardial infarction or a stroke is a strong relative contraindication for anti vegf drugs. So these are the overall main ones but you can, you know, list a lot of relative contraindications also. So do you tend to reduce the dose of anti-VHF, uh, especially uh, ranibizumab when considering for stroke patients, a 5 mg to a 3 mg, or are you comfortable with 5 mg dose? Uh, so um, I, I don't uh, reduce dose in any of these, uh, you know, only indications so far I've heard or people practice is an ROP, but uh, the drug in a lower dose will not be efficacious. So it, is, it doesn't matter uh, if you give a half dose, it's like not giving at all because you won't see the benefit, right? So if you have fever and there is some contraindication and half dose is not probably going to work. So it's the same thing. So we don't give half dose uh, in these cases. Uh, Dr. Sony wants to know about Converseps sustained release. Uh... So, Converseps, uh, uh, you know, is uh, mainly up, approved in China. We, we in India don't use it. Most of the world doesn't use it. But is there any specific question that you would like to ask? Because uh, Converseps trials uh, were, uh, I don't know if they've been completed in the US. Uh, I know they were starting Converseps trials, but I don't know about, uh, they are not being given in the US uh, right now. But yes, in China, they are being used. And they have shown uh, non-inferiority uh, with the other anti vegf agents. But in terms of uh, side effect profile, whether it's different, overall, the data shows probably it's no different from the anti -VEGF, other anti vegf agents. But uh, uh, most of the world is not using it currently. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rajneesh has a question, which I'm... Uh... I'm not sure what he means. What is the basis of giving brimonidine in ARMD? How it works? Any possible role of it? Oh, so brimonidine, uh, Dr. Rajji, it's, it's not being tried for um, uh, wet ARMD, but for dry ARMD, um, you know, geographic atrophy, people have uh, tried that, including uh, as a sustained release. Uh, but overall, I would say that it has not uh, reached the primary endpoint. And that's why uh, it has not been used. But brimonidine, uh, people talked about, you know, you must have heard it's a neuroprotectant. Now, uh, whether it's a proven neuroprotectant, nobody knows. But somehow people have caught on to it. People have promoted it as a neuroprotectant. So you just give it. And there people have tried in dry RMD, but it did not work. Uh, Dr. Sony wants to know before intravitreal injections, uh, do we need to dilate pupil and why, sir? Oh, you mean, so before intravitreal injection, should we dilate the pupil? Uh, I don't dilate the pupil before intravitreal injection. It used to be a common practice in the earlier days. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that what you are doing today, and if it changes after a few years, that what you are doing today is wrong. Uh, like, let's say for brolicizumab, people started off uh, after injection, they will call the next day, then the third day, then one week. That is because people were not sure what will happen. Inflammation will come uh, so in the early time phase after the injection, will it come in the later phase? But they're very cautious. Now we know people who give brolicizumab don't call the patient uh, any different from the other anti vegf agents. But it's about uh, caution. Uh, so people earlier uh, were used to be cautious about intravitreal injection. They wanted to do, uh, you know, uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy after giving the injection, check the uh, pulsation, check the light perception after the injection. Uh, 
those were being done earlier but it is no longer being followed at least people who are uh, who have changed there may still be some people who have not changed with this practice uh, but uh, most people are not dilating after intravitreal these 0.05 ml anti vagus agents now mark my word so tomorrow if you are doing pneumatic retinopexy and you are injecting 0.3 cc of gas and there you say i don't dilate and i don't check the light percentage that's wrong but for the standard dose of 50 microliter there is no consequence on the intraocular pressure in this uh, volume Probably, Dr. Raja, it used to be more often done when we were using 4 mg of tri triamcin alone and 0.1 ml. So that was where it all started off using higher dose with steroid. Yeah. There. Yes, you are right, Ritesh. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Rajneesh also wants to. Sorry, Dr. Soni wants to know uh, role of ARDS2 in wet AMD. so role of variants to in wet amd by that i am assuming that your question is should we continue the uh, arets formulations in patients with wet armd now uh, that's a very loaded question but uh, i would say a very good question a very smart question because what what did arets do what did it try to achieve ARDS was not a treatment for wet ARMD for sure. So if you say that uh, I give wet, uh, you know, ARDS in wet ARMD, what's it going to achieve? You have to ask that question and see why was ARDS even developed. So ARDS was to prevent advanced ARMD in patients who have intermediate ARMD, right? So patients who have early ARMD is just one or two drops and of small size. uh even in those patients it has not been recommended but we have been giving it to all patients many of us have given it was like hcq hcq for covid initially was being given for uh, you know the data came for patients who had severe covid but people started taking for prophylaxis also there was no data but same way areds it is proven for intermediate armd prevention to advanced armd but once you reach advanced armd whether errat formulation of any use there is no data in fact i mean it is like yeah you need not give but those who have intermediate dry armd in those patients if you give what is late stage armd either geographic atrophy or conversion to cnvm both were reduced in intermediate armd patient so if you have a wet armd patient of cnvm and we are giving errat formula i would say uh, you know i would not give for that wet armd but what about the other eye that's very important because if one eye has wet armd the other eye has dry armd it's already at a high risk and in those patients you uh, must go by the research evidence that errat formulation would be useful in preventing uh, form, uh, formation of late stage armd in the other eye so that would be the reason why you give the errat formulation Okay, uh, Doctor Sony wants to know how often do we see cuticular drusens in young adults, and do we see CNVM changes in them too? Uh, typically, cuticular, as far as I know, is a more older uh, age group uh, drusen. So she wants to know how often do we see them in young adults? No, I I haven't seen in a sense. You know, I don't remember. I may have seen a few patients, but it's so rare. Uh, that is very difficult to quantify. I don't think it would have any significance as such. Uh, but unless the drusen, you know, even if uh, they are there in a younger age patient, if they are numerous, they may be a sign that they this patient may be at a higher risk of ARMD because drusen can undergo changes and then they they can lead to atrophy of the RP cause relative hypoxia and the choroid. brooks membrane changes and lead to a cnvm but it's not common i am unable to put an exact figure on that and uh, so on the chat box la one of the last questions is dr rajneesh wants to know which of the amslet screen types is most accurate uh, for armd and which one is the easiest for self monitoring at home for patients so frankly speaking um we have stopped uh, doing home amslet at this point of time i don't even know anybody talks about this uh, till about uh, maybe 8 uh, to 10 years ago amsler monitoring uh, was recommended in many of these patients 
but now what we do is uh, more than the ampsler which may or may not be picked up um, i would say that uh, uh, whenever these patients come we have either early oct signs because many of these armd patients keep coming to us once in 3 months and any early armd sign including uh, let us say an incipient cnvm we are asking these patients to come once in 3 months and that is probably more sensitive than an ampsler check because if you there have been num- numerous studies on ampsler uh, grid in armd uh, but it's not a very sensitive indicator of progression uh, to you know that patient should uh, come across for a test or that this patient has actually uh, converted or recent progression has happened but overall i would say that uh, i don't recommend none of my colleagues are re- right now recommending in any of these uh, you know ampsler grid tests dr mary many more questions on youtube or um, yeah one question but um, yeah the regarding the if there is hemorrhage in wet amd does anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy inhibit the resolution of the hemorrhage task Uh, there have been numerous studies on uh, the occurrence of subarachnoid hemorrhage that patients who are on anticoagulants uh, have a higher risk of uh, actually massive subarachnoid hemorrhage but in terms of resolution once the bleeding has happened whatever blood is remaining in the subarachnoid space whether there is any difference after the bleeding i am not sure because the the resolution of the blood is as a different mechanism compared to the actual bleeding now once it has caused bleeding it's not a continuous process it's just one time event in general when these patients bleed so in my opinion i don't think there has to be any difference in the resolution of the uh, uh, you know blood once it has uh, uh, bled uh, continuing of anticoagulants would make any difference but yes those who have um, are on anticoagulants are at a higher risk and if one eye has bled then the other eye also can bleed so from that perspective uh, i think it may be a good thing to talk to the cardiologist or the neurologist cardiovascular specialist to titrate the anticoagulant so that you minimize the risk of bleeding especially in the eye uh, that becomes very important Else, Another question is what are the what are the treatment options if anti-VEGF is contraindicated? Now, uh, anti-VEGF in CNVM is a big challenge if there is a contraindication. Now, uh, there may be relative contraindication of uh, stroke versus uh, you know um, myocardial infarction for non-CNVM cases. like dme or rvo uh, steroids are uh, a very nice option so w- what about armd now i do look at relative contraindication versus absolute contraindication obviously if the patient is pregnant and not one eyed i do not uh, inject those patients uh, you know but i must confess that in one particular young lady hi myo both eyes one eye is already counting fingers the other eye is deteriorating from 624 to 660 as recurrent cnvm and the patient understands the risk of the pregnancy of the child uh, so that patient from absolute contraindication became a relative contraindication now you still take multiple opinions two three different opinions and make sure that the patient understands that uh, in pregnancy we don't give uh, but then i did give that patient especially in the last trimester where the risk is least so uh, so from that i i would say that in arm in cnvm cases what would you do what are the other options pdt pdt is not an option now the other option is ttt ttt is definitely an option Uh, if it is an extra foveal cnvm you can do thermal laser and in earlier days 
during ivta time that is early 2000s even for armd ivta was being given it did have some effect but not mm-hmm. a full effect maybe you can stretch out the initial uh, contraindication period because whatever i mentioned contraindication absolutely is also has an expiry date so contraindication is not always permanent unless it's a drug by itself then you change the drug okay if patient has reaction to brolicizumab don't give the brolicism but give lucentis or some other injection so uh, but the tricky situation comes uh, most common is pregnancy and recent myocardial infarction there you may have to buy time either do ttt or give ivta and you can discuss and take opinions and uh, consent the patient specifically for that that's all sir thank you so much thank you bhim thank you dr raja that was uh... an amazing session we had today on amd i hope the post graduates would go through it more than once and revise it for their exams a very important part of their examination i'm sure they're going to encounter amd in either long case short case or even questions format somewhere or the other thank you thank you sir once more thank you sir thank you, thank you all on wednesday we have dr rohan chawla who will be talking on pathological myopia we hope to see all of you again <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the mix up. Thank you.